And I'd like to start by welcoming everybody to today's event. Thank you for joining us for this EPSS Distinguished Alumni Lecture. Today's event is part of a wonderful tradition of inviting back to campus one of our alumni and give them the opportunity to share more about their careers, life at UCLA, and future projects. It also gives our alumnus an opportunity to connect with faculty and current students. It is one of the most fun and cherished events this year, of the year. Today, we welcome Hilary Petriso, a carbon capture and sequestration commercial development manager at SoCal Gas. Very soon, we will hear much more about Hilary and the exciting uh, work that she does. Now, my name is Miguel Garcia Garibay. I'm the Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, EPSS event. Now, in my role as Dean of Physical Sciences, I have the opportunity to interact with an amazing community uh, that includes this department. I think this is actually the department that where uh, faculty and students really develop the, the deepest, most, most meaningful connections because there is opportunity to do field work. It's a tight department, it's a close department. And it's one that I, that I really envy because of that. This is very, very unique, and I congratulate all of you for, uh, for many of the good things that go on and that you do. Now, of course, there are other departments in the physical sciences. Uh, physical sciences is an academic unit within the College of Letters and Sciences. And it has departments that have really made an enormous impact, just like EPSS, and that includes the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, uh, the Department of Mathematics, Physics and Astronomy, Statistics, the, department, the, the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, and several other affiliated departments. So this is a community of physical scientists that really explore you know, the entire universe, although in many ways EPSS owns a good chunk of it. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences has done a remarkable job in helping us understand and protect our home in the universe. Right? That's the department motto, as I understand. Through discovery, education, and outreach, our faculty and students also strive to foster an inclusive culture of respect and collaboration, openness to new ideas, new methodologies, and be ready for discoveries and to share them. Today's event uh, celebrates our alumni's accomplishments, uh, the department's commitments to higher education and research. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite the department of EPSS Chair, Carolina Litko Bertelloni, to introduce our speaker this evening. Carolina. Thank you, thank you, Miguel, for that introduction and your kind words about EPSS. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We are the physical sciences division because all the work happens on Earth, therefore. Um, <laughs> everything done in the division belongs to us. Um, uh, in any case, I actually, I'm so very pleased to be here and good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, Miguel introduced me. My name is Carolina Lethgau Bertoloni. I have the longest name in the department. Um, so you can just learn the first uh, part. Uh, before I start, I actually, I'd like to thank Miguel and Beatriz for being here. We only asked Miguel to attend like just a couple of days ago, and so he made time in his really busy schedule to be able to come see us. And let me thank the development team, Loida de Leon, Ana Vasquez, and Andrea Corrales, who have organized this on, you know, not a whole lot of notice and made this happen for the first time after two years of interruption due to COVID. And of course, this wouldn't have happened without the help of my chief administrative chief, is that what it's called? Whatever, CAO, officer of my department, Carlene Brown, who is doing double duty these days because of all the staff challenges that we have. So thank you uh, to all of you. Um, I want to welcome the EPSS family. I see that many of my colleagues are here, uh, both uh, you know, that are still active and um, you know, sort of actively teaching, but also are very active emerita. So thank you for coming. Um, our alumni, um, our, our staff, um, and friends of the department uh, to the EPSS Distinguished Alumni Lecture. 
Um, I really believe, you know, I've been chair for maybe six months now. Um, and, you know, people say congratulations, and I say, wait, wait, it's more like condolences. Yeah. But, uh, but actually, actually, that is not the case, because it is actually a great honor for me to be the chair of this department, because I really believe strongly in the scientific and educational excellence of my department. And I think this event is proof of it. My goal as chair will be to preserve our mission and our tradition of excellence across all areas. And I think that starts by refreshing and strengthening our ties to each other, scientifically and socially, and especially with our alumni and friends of EPSS. And you know, our students in the back and our graduate student organization, EPSSSO, um, is actually selling some t-shirts so you can have a memento uh, of you know, this event and of our department. Um, you know, by starting this event and resuming this annual event, uh, I am now delighted to introduce our distinguished alumna speaker, uh, Hilary Strong Petrizzo. Uh, Hilary is a commercial development manager in the SoCal Gas Clean Energy Innovations, a CEI group. Um, and I understand actually that many colleagues from SoCal Gas are here supporting Hilary. So thank you so much for coming. Um, <laughs> She leads the carbon capture and sequestration team. In this role, she's working to bring federal funding to California to advance the vision of transporting CO2 captured from the air and industrial sources to permanent underground storage sites in overall support of California's climate goals. During her career, Hillary also led the hydrogen engineering team, and we heard a lot about that at dinner, and it's fascinating, and reservoir engineering team at SoCal Gas, and worked as a petroleum geologist in California and Texas. She spent most of the pandemic juggling her kids' virtual school, and in fact, Dom and Zoe, thank you for coming and listening to us all this time. Um, and uh, uh, with virtual presentation actually to national labs, state and federal agencies and research groups on underground geologic storage of hydrogen. Um, Hillary earned a master's in earth sciences from the University of Texas at Austin, but of course we're extremely proud that she earned her bachelor's degree in geology here at EPSS in UCLA. So we will be collecting the index cards for a short uh, uh, question and answer session, but please let me welcome Hillary now, help me. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, you know, if you know me, you know how much I love UCLA, and so this is truly the honor of a lifetime. Uh, thank you, Dean McGill, Chair Carolina, uh, to uh, my my neighbors uh, from La Cañada Book Club, um, the, some of my Girl Scouts, um, some of my colleagues from SoCal Gas. You know, it's just it's so great for you to be here uh, to celebrate with this meet. So thank you so much. Um, so, let's see. <laughs> So my talk tonight is on adjusting the model. And um, when I was invited, you know, I'm a geologist. I've spent a lot of time in geology. But I, I want to make this an accessible talk. So it's really going to be about like, getting out of your comfort zone, getting new ideas, and those open up new opportunities. So that'll be the theme through tonight. And uh, most importantly, I do want to thank my family for being here, my husband, who, as I was saying at dinner, um, we, you know, we fell in love uh, at UCLA on a geology field trip. And uh, and then, of course, um, my two most favorite people, my children, Dominic and Zoe, uh, who I, I understand were admitted to the UCLA geology department based on uh, their cross sections. <laughs> Uh, Professor Onion said Hillary was a was a good scientist, but these cross sections from my children are are excellent. So <laughs> I'm so glad that you here are here today. Um, so here's uh, just a few memories from UCLA. So I um, came to UCLA in 2003, and I got to come to campus early because I was in the marching band, as you can see. And I was in the marching band for all four years. And so um, an interesting fact about the marching band is, you know, you'd think it'd be a lot of music majors. But actually, most of the marching band majors are engineers and, and physical wow. scientists. So I think it's this you know, understanding that you know, science, engineering, art, music, they all go together. And then, of course, um, 
that field trip on the right. So here's a picture of, of me um, on the right. And my husband is in the picture too. So we were on a, a geology field trip to the Grand Canyon. So just a little bit of a, you know, kind of a snapshot of my time at UCLA. And uh, so when I came to UCLA, I came as undeclared physical sciences. So I, I knew I wanted to do something in the sciences. Um, I had taken a class in physics in high school. I really liked it, and I'm a big Star Trek fan. So you know, something undeclared physical sciences seemed right. And um, I took a, my first geology class with um, uh, Professor Paul Davis, and I just fell in love with the class. And so I went over to the administration office, and I met with Lori Holbrook. And if you know Lori, I got the most enthusiastic welcome to the geology department. You know, she was so excited that I was going to become a geology major. And um, if you also know Lori, she gave me a lifetime supply of Smarties candies. So I think I still have a few of them. Um, but yeah, so I, I became a geology major. And I, I had a really wonderful experience. I went on to grad school at the University of Texas at Austin, where I studied um, submarine landslides. I am not going to get into that tonight. But that did open the door to, um, to intern with ExxonMobil and then go work for ExxonMobil. So I started out my career as a petroleum geologist. And uh, one thing about me, though, I'm, I'm very environmentally conscious. So it was more that the opportunity presented itself to go into petroleum. And so I did work in petroleum for many years. Um, but now today, you know, I work in climate change projects. And uh, it's because of this foundation, I would say, in petroleum geology that I now am able to work in climate change projects. Uh, I'll talk about it more, but I am. Um, you know, I spent time working on oil rigs in Bakersfield, and now I'm working on projects in Bakersfield to capture CO2 out of the ground and put it back underground. So really, uh, just the theme tonight again will be whatever your foundation may be, whether it's art or music or the law, that foundation can really carry you through for so many opportunities. Um, so, you know, my tie-in tonight is going to be on geology. But I, I recognize everyone in the audience is most likely not a geology major. So we're going to just kind of go through a few geology basics. So we're going to start out with uh, sedimentary geology. So most of the work I've done in geology is focused on sedimentary geology. I'm pretty much focused on sandstones, which tend to hold things like oil, and in the future will hold CO2. And then um, more sealing rocks like shale, siltstone, that kind of hold in those liquids. And uh, so. To get everyone on the same page, you know, if you know a geologist, they probably at one point have said that the Earth is like a layer cake. So let's all picture a layer cake. Here's one in case you need help. So yeah, so if you're if you're kind of a stratigraphy-focused geologist or a sedimentary geologist, you pretty much think of life as like a layer cake. And so the basic principles are, you know, you lay down a layer of rocks, you lay down another layer of rocks so on and so forth. So just like this layer cake, you know, this is how rocks generally are deposited. And again, those, uh, those uh, sponge layers are, are perfect places to find oil or to store CO2. And those frosting layers help to keep everything in place. All right, so now that we have that clear understanding, <laughs> yeah. the other thing that's important to understand is that the rocks don't always stay flat. And in California, we know that. And the rocks don't stay flat because of faulting, which in California, we also know a lot about, about faults. So just the kind of the key things to take away here, again, is um, you know, if you have a fault, it may move your rocks around. It may thrust them up. It may um, have them come down. It may create some sort of folds. And so you know, when you think about petroleum geology, OK, you're looking for rocks that have oil, check. You're looking for sealing rocks to keep it in place, check. But what also helps to keep oil in place is having some sort of uh, structural closure. So it could be a fault, it could be a fold, but that just adds, again, to that sealing nature. So that's what petroleum geologists are looking for in addition to the right kinds of rocks. So if we find the right kind of rocks and we have the right kind of trap, we start drilling. So the other kind of key thing to know for my talk is just some basics of drilling. So when you drill a well, be it for oil or water or to inject CO2, um, you can get a lot of information from drilling. So as you drill through the earth, uh, little bits of rock come back up. And so as the, the diagram shows here, you know, so I start drilling, some of the gray rock from that first formation will come up. But then at some point, 
the rocks will change color. This is something you can observe. So, so all of a sudden, the rocks become kind of this more tan layer. You keep drilling, you get into the dark gray layer. And so this is how you can you know, get some data and begin to understand what might be going on uh, you know, beyond the area that you're drilling from. So those are kind of the key things to know. Right kind of rocks, right kind of structure. And then when you drill, you do get new data. So if you keep all those things in mind, um, here's some rocks, because I don't know that I've showed enough rocks yet, and this is a <laughs> geology talk. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, this, this is a, a real rock formation, and you can see it's doing just kind of what the picture showed. You have that curvature, and uh, so, you know, we can assume that that curvature probably continues as we get deeper. And so that's what I've drawn here is, okay, the curvature is probably continuing through. And so this is where the analogy comes in of, um, you know, life being like a geologic model. So most things in life, you know, are, are at the surface. There's a lot that we see at the surface. There's a lot we know about the surface. And then taking the analogy further with the drilling, so for all of us, there's an area in our life where we've drilled deeper. You know, I, I got a degree in geology. You know, I'm working on climate change projects. I'm involved in my community. But all of us have areas in life where we've drilled deeper. And so, you know, we could go through life just kind of staying on this side with what we know. And probably if we step out a little bit, we'll get more of the same. Um, but there's times in life, too, by choice or by chance, where we do, we do pick up a new data point. So, you know, we got the picture repeated on the left. Here's the picture again on the right. So there's times in life where maybe we literally drill a new well, or we kind of metaphorically open ourselves up to new opportunities, get out of our comfort zone. And so you can see here, you know, based on the data I had, my diagram on the left was, was perfectly fine and, and could have very well been accurate. But I drilled a new well and I found out, oh, there's this other layer here. So again, that's kind of the theme of you know, get out of your comfort zone, you find some new data, you find some new opportunities, and then you have this, this new interpretation. So, uh, for this evening, I'll be going through kind of three areas of my life, my time at UCLA, uh, my professional life, and my personal life, and just keep going through these same themes of, I got out of my comfort zone, I was open to new ideas and new interpretations, and that brought about new opportunities. So here I am doing field work. Um, and uh, I, I previewed this presentation for my neighbor. And her first question was, where are you? And I, I didn't actually remember. But uh, I know it was a ski resort somewhere in Nevada or Utah. But here you can see I'm, I'm doing field work. You know, I'm in my element. Uh, this was a great opportunity. It was so great that I actually went, uh, went through field work twice. So, uh, uh, by choice. Um, but let's, let's go back about two years. So, two years prior to this picture, I was taking a class called Advanced Mapping with Professor Peter Bird, and um, we had to do field work. And I'll let you in on a secret. I was really nervous to do field work um, because growing up, I had never camped. And we went out to a place called Rainbow Basin where the rocks are as colorful as all the drawings I've shown you. It's a great place to learn. But I was just, I was really nervous. Um, and the weekend came to go out in the field, and it rained. So it's like a bit of a reprieve, but also kind of prolonging the inevitable. And so finally, the, um, the makeup weekend came, and we went out, and I loved it. I just, I loved field work. And so again, it's this example of getting out of my comfort zone through the requirement of the class and finding out field work is great. So I ended up you know, continuing to do field work at UCLA. I really enjoyed it. And I even thought that perhaps I would um, end up doing my master's really focused on field work. And, um, and you know, I ended up not doing that. I ended up spending more time in the lab. But I really did you know, get this appreciation of field work. So you know, thinking about all that time I spent in the lab, um, I'm going to move kind of to the next area of new interpretations. So I want you all to think of a scientist. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming we're thinking, you know, someone very logical, uh, someone very, you know, data oriented. Um, 
So yeah, so when I was a student at UCLA, I thought I'm a science major, so what's really important is the data and the facts. And um, I took a class with Professor Ray Ingersoll, and um, you know, kind of the requirements of the class is you make a geologic map, and then you write a report, and your report you know, goes through all of your geologic interpretations. And Ray was wonderful. He offered everyone in the class an opportunity to, um, to read their reports in advance. So we're all working in the computer lab on our reports and thinking, okay, he's gonna read our reports and tell us, uh, tell us if our geologic interpretations are right. So we get our reports back and he didn't mark up anything about the geologic interpretations. What he did was he corrected our grammar and he corrected our syntax and he corrected our word choice. And it was you know, something that really brought it home for me that scientists, it's not just the data. If you have good data, but you cannot clearly convey a message in a way that people can understand, then you're not gonna be as successful. So what I learned from that class is the importance of, you know, it's the quality of your data, but nowadays, in fact, I think unfortunately nowadays, the way you present it is more important than the quality. So I like to carry through, of course, with good quality and good presentations, but this is something that I think really opened my eyes. And you know, throughout grad school, through my time at SoCal Gas, you know, I've always been complimented on my clear and concise writing, and that you know was really established for me at UCLA is how to how to convey a message in a clear way that people can understand. So uh, you know, a really great great message to learn at UCLA. So um, so kind of wrapping up my time at UCLA, moving on to new opportunities. The last uh, snapshot I want to share is. Um, a conversation that I had. So I had a conversation with, um, with a student who's about to graduate, and he was asking me, what are you gonna do after graduation? And I said, well, a lot of geologists get masters. That's pretty common. And he said, well, what would you do after that? I said, well, I'm not sure. I really like geology. You know, maybe I could be a geology professor. And he said, well, yeah, I guess you have to because geology is not that practical. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I wish, I wish I had had that conversation with him after I took a class called Engineering Geology. So in my last year, I took a class called Engineering Geology with Paul Merrifield, and um, I learned in that class that you need geology for everything. I mean, everything. If you are working on a remodel or a new house in Los Angeles with any sort of slope, you need a geologist. I mean, this diagram here, this comes from the California Department of Conservation, which houses the California Geologic Survey. I mean, from surface to 10,000 feet below us, you need geologists for all sorts of projects. You need them for energy, you need them for um, you know, mining projects, you need them to solve climate change. You need geologists to solve climate change because we have this fundamental understanding of the earth, but we also have this understanding of knowing that kind of the data we're working with, that we're never gonna have the whole picture. Like, I work on subsurface rocks, I really don't see much of them. So being open to new interpretations, being open to new ideas, those are the skill sets that geologists have that make them so critical for today's uh, climate change projects. So that kind of transitions me into um, to some of the work that I've done in my professional life. So just, just a reminder, the focus areas. So getting out of my comfort zone, being open to new ideas and interpretations, and that opened new opportunities. So in my professional life, I started out as a petroleum geologist. And so petroleum geologist, um, like I mentioned before with drilling, in the olden days, you drill and pieces of rock come up and you can start to put together a model of what it might look like. And uh, so I know there's a lot going on here and you know, kind of take away what you will from it. But, um, but nowadays, you can do a lot with computers in geology, and you can collect a lot more geologic data from logging tools. So what's rendered here is just one geologic formation, the one with oil, that's the important one for the petroleum geologist. So there's actually thousands of feet of rock above, it's just not modeled. But kind of the key thing to take away is that there's a lot you can do with computers and geology. And the two wells that have those extra colorful lines next to them, those are wells that were newer, and so you can collect data like real time. So someone's drilling, and you immediately know what geologic formation you're in. So keeping that in your mind, um, you know, I was working for a company uh, 
you know, doing some drilling, and I had gotten to a new office, a new office, I was focused on a new field, and so the geologist in charge there gave me his geologic model. And I apologize to him, this is a gross oversimplification. But, uh, but basically he said, okay, Hillary, here's my geologic model, and I've planned out this well, and all you need to do is just follow the real-time data coming in. And I was like, okay, that, that seems pretty straightforward. And so this is what was supposed to happen, is just drill, find oil, all good. Um, so we start drilling, and um, all of a sudden, things are not looking right. Um, we, uh, the, the geologic formation doesn't seem right. You know, the, the rocks are not matching. The data from the rocks are not matching the model. And so I call him up. I think he was, you know, headed out on vacation, and I was like, you know, the rocks, the data from the rocks are not matching the model. It's like, no, it's fine, just keep drilling. And uh, so I found my boss, who's an engineer, and he asked an extremely valid question, which is, well, but do we find oil? Because it's a petroleum geology company. It's like, no, we found water. <laughs> so we, we don't want that. We don't want that. So, um, so right, so here's what, what, here's how I fixed it. Um, so called up the rig, and I said, please stop drilling. And um, we need to do what's called a side track. So, so we had drilled into this water formation, and we need to kind of go back up a little bit and then kick off and start drilling in a different direction. And so what you need to, uh, to do there is fill the, the hole with cement, essentially, so you don't, you don't want the water to start flowing in. So you, you seal it off with cement, and so that's what I did. I, um, I literally adjusted a geologic model, and uh, we, re we re-drilled it, and we found oil. So absolutely getting out of my comfort zone here, folks. I mean, really just out of my comfort zone. Um, but, um, but I you know, continued my time as a petroleum geologist, and I, um, I got pretty adept at planting wells and following wells as they were drilled. And one thing folks may not know about California is, um, you know, people have been drilling for oil in California for over 100 years. Um, there's actually a lot of oil in California. And um, because people have been drilling for over 100 years, there are a lot of um, other wells that may be around, like that model showed. Uh, you may be in an area where there are several other wells. And so what's really important is to not drill into another well. So it's very critical to not drill into another well. And you do lots of QA, QC, and I got very good with all the steps you need to take to not drill into another well. So then there came a day when there was a well that was leaking. And so how do you stop a well that's leaking? You drill a new well and you drill into it. And, uh, and so I did. I successfully worked on a team that we drilled in to a well that was leaking. We, we sealed it off and everything went really well. And um, I bring up that example because, you know, this is a new interpretation, right? I, um, and I, you know, I found some great quotes that kind of say it better for me, but, um, but because I knew how to not drill into another well, I knew how to drill into another well. Because I had that foundation, you know, like, like Pablo Picasso said, you know, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist, or as the Dalai Lama said, know the rules well so you can break them effectively. So it really was this, because I have a fundamental understanding as a geologist, you know, I have more opportunities than I realize. And I think this is when something really clicked for me as a person because, again, environmentally minded, I was working for a petroleum company, I really wasn't happy, and um, it wasn't what, you know, I think best aligned with me. And so I took some time off to be, you know, with my kids, which was great. Uh, and then I started to look for new opportunities where I could take my skill sets but apply them to something else. And uh, so I was able to do that. I, um, and that's where I like this last quote from Maya Angelou, like, I did then what I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. So, so I know that, you know, never any doubt that fossil fuels contribute to climate change. It was more just I've been able to find employment as a petroleum geologist, and so that's what I did. But then working on this project where I had to kind of break the rules, I realized, no, my foundation has set me up for a lot of new opportunities. So that gets me into some of the work that I've done now. 
um, that I'm doing now. So, so again, talking about climate change, um, I, you know, I think we're all on the same page here that climate change is a real issue that needs real solutions, that needs geologists to solve them. Um, I, I want to show the problem in kind of two different ways to recognize that you know, people process things differently. So, so if you're more graphically minded, we'll start at the bottom. And we have on our, our y-axis um, gigatons of CO2 emissions. And then on our x-axis is time. So this actually starts back in 1980. So you can see over the years, we as humans have been emitting a lot of CO2. And so there's some key things that we need to do. We need to emit less CO2 as a society. We need to switch to cleaner fuels. We need to be more efficient. We need to reduce. Um, and so that's what the brown part of the graph is showing, basically, is we as a society need to reduce our emissions. We need to decarbonize. Uh, but the green part that actually drops below the y-axis into the negative space is, is basically a recognition that we need to do something about the CO2 already in the air that we've already emitted. So it's very critical that we reduce our emissions, but it's also important to have a solution for those emissions that are currently in the air. And so that's one of the things that I've been really focused on in my career. Um, another way to put it is on the left, and I like this one a lot too. Um, so if you think about the earth as a bathtub, you know, to have a nice bath, you do need some amount of warm water. You know, we're a Goldilocks planet. We need some amount of greenhouse gases to have people and plants. Um, but yeah, as the, the graph shows and as the picture shows, our emissions are, are far outweighing um, the net removals. So the net removals, I think we all know, it's, it's trees that capture CO2. It's California state rocks or pentonite that can naturally absorb some CO2. Um, but for the most part, we are out of whack. We have overflowed the bathtub. So that's where we need a solution, uh, which is carbon management. And so just to kind of get into, again, how there's this um, sort of transformation, um, what we're uh, focused on here is, again, capturing the CO2 out of the air and then finding a place to put it. And so uh, one thing I forgot to mention is, um, is in between my time of graduate school and my time doing work on computer modeling geology, I did actually spend almost a year in Bakersfield just working on rigs. So I was out on rigs. Um, there was a lot of drilling going on at the time. And it's a great way to get an appreciation for everything that goes into energy. So um, when they drill a well, they drill 24-7. So I may have to go up to the rig in the middle of the night, often in the middle of the night. And, um, but it was very interesting you know, to learn the process behind that. And um, I got a real appreciation, too, for how important petroleum is to the city of Bakersfield and Kern County as a whole. Um, this is a big, big source of res uh, revenue for them. And a lot of people you know, do come out of poverty from being in the petroleum industry. So that's something that I, I saw firsthand. And so knowing that Kern County is very tied to the petroleum industry as, as what has drawn me to work on projects that are focused there. Uh, I'll never forget the time that I came through Kern County years later when you know, oil was at a low point and there was a man just sleeping by a rig. You know, he'd probably worked on that rig. So, so this idea of, you know, I was a petroleum geologist and now I'm working on climate change projects. I got that new opportunity. My hope is that for everyone who's worked on some of the fossil fuel industry projects has that opportunity to transition as well and really utilize the skill sets that they've developed. Um, but, but kind of getting more into you know, the geology part of it. So essentially the concept is that, um, that we can capture CO2 from the air. That's called direct air capture. Or we can capture CO2 directly from uh, the source. So that could be a cement plant. Uh, that could be some sort of industrial facility. Um, but there's different technologies that are able to capture some of that CO2. And then you transport it, and then it's got to go somewhere. So when we think about where should the CO2 go, we can think about where it came from, which is oil fields. And again, California has a lot of oil fields. It particularly has a lot of oil fields in the Kern County region. So that's why uh, there's such focus on this area, is the 100 years or more of oil production does mean that there is space underground for CO2. And so you can see just kind of the concept here. Again, if you think back to that drilling rig, you know, it's a very transferable skill set. It's very intuitive for folks who spent their careers drilling wells is, 
just like you drill for oil, you are now drilling deep, deep, deep into the earth. So it's in metric, I apologize, but <laughs> deep, deep, deep into the earth uh, to just inject the CO2 and it just stays there. And so this is the climate change solution that I've been working on and I'm, I'm very proud of it. Um, and as Carolina mentioned, as I alluded to, um, I'm, I'm primarily focused on you know, how can we reuse these old oil fields for a better purpose of storing CO2. But I've also spent some time looking into uh, clean fuels and how can we also leverage an understanding of geology uh, to work on clean fuels projects like green hydrogen. So happy to talk about that more offline, but I think it just goes to show, like I learned from my engineering geology class, like having a foundation in geology opens you up to so many possibilities because you understand the Earth's processes. So that's kind of a, a snapshot of my um, professional life. So now I want to get into my personal life. And again, opportunities that I've had because I got out of my comfort zone. So some pictures here. Um, so I live in La Cañada, uh, not too far away, and we've been there for about five years. And when I moved to La Cañada, I noticed it had a serious problem with speeding. People just drive too fast. And uh, at first I thought, well, maybe that's just how it is. But then I realized this is a real safety issue. And uh, so I got out of my comfort zone, and I applied to be on the Public Works and Traffic Commission for La Cañada. So I um, applied during the pandemic, and I put together my resume, and I talked about some of the activism I had done, reaching out to the state senator, reaching out to Caltrans, reaching out to um, the sheriff to get at least more enforcement. And so I applied, and there's five city council folks, and uh, I got one vote, which is actually like, for a non-political person, I feel like that was pretty good. And, uh, and then one of the commissioners reached out to me and said she's moving to Canada and that uh, you know, I should put in for her open spot. And it was interesting because when I had applied the first time, I only focused on my passion for solving the traffic pro uh, problem. But then I realized you know, the commission is called Public Works and Traffic. And I am a geologist who works for a utility who has spent a career on multi-million dollar engineering geology projects. So when I reapplied, I really focused on that. Like I am passionate about the traffic, but I am also qualified because of the public works component. And so this time, I got two votes. So I feel like if I go for it a third time, But, um, but no, in all seriousness, I think, again, that kind of sparked something in me of, um, like, say yes to more things. Um, so I started to look at my community, and uh, there was a, a group of women who wanted to form a book club. And so I said yes to the book club, which has been amazing. Um, there's also a group of women called the La Cañada Junior Women's Club. And so they're the ones on the left. And um, they meet monthly, kind of in a social capacity, but they also meet monthly for service events. And so I know a lot of them wanted to be here tonight, um, but one of our service events is tonight. And the main service event that we do is every, um, every um, month, we get together at someone's house. And what we do is we make 50 lunches for the Pasadena um, Union Station Homelessness Center. So you know, you think about the, the scale of climate change, and it's huge, and it feels like it doesn't matter what we do, like we can't make a drop, and you think about you know, the scale of homelessness and it's huge and what can we do, but I learned from being in this group, that act of just making those 50 lunches does make a difference. And so I'm so glad that I said yes to that opportunity. And conveniently, they usually meet during public works and traffic, so like I don't feel so bad that uh, you know, it worked out that way. But um, what I wanna close with is, um, is on the Girl Scout. So my daughter here is a Girl Scout and her friend Katerina is a Girl Scout. And so my girls are pictured here. And my, uh, my fellow troop leader, Lorraine Chang, she's on the left. Um, she wanted to be here tonight. She's a full-time urgent care doctor, so it just didn't work for her schedule. But um, again, about two years ago, uh, there was um, sort of a situation that arose where nine girls needed a leader. Uh, they needed a Girl Scout troop leader. And I had never been a Girl Scout, like I told you. I mean, doing field work. I had never been camping because I wasn't a Girl Scout. 
Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I just was like, I don't know about this. I mean, there's getting out of your comfort zone, and then there's doing something that you feel like you're not even qualified for. But I thought about it more, and I realized that I had the opportunity to make a huge impact in these nine girls' lives. And if anything, I mean, actually, they've made more of an impact on me. But, uh, but I'm happy to say we've been camping twice. <laughs> Um, and we've, uh, we've done some hikes, and um, we've done some fundraising, and we've had some just great conversations about things like, like bullying, and I mean, they, they know so much about climate change, it's really impressive, so really, I mean, this has been, for me, just such a, a fulfilling opportunity. So I'm just really glad to say uh, that, you know, I got out of my comfort zone, I had a new interpretation, and I, uh, I had this amazing new opportunity. And so, uh, kind of in closing, uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of have a shout out for is, is going back to field work. So like I mentioned, I was nervous about field work. Turns out I liked field work. My husband and I fell in love on a camping trip. Um, but I, I did want to ask tonight, since I do have you all here, uh, the UCLA EPSS department is looking to raise funds for the field work program. Um, and they have a goal, I think it's $600,000 in the next three years. And um, I, I bring that up because, um, first of all, I want you to join me in giving if you're willing. Uh, my, my family and I will be donating $5,000 to this program. As a student, I received a $500 award. And I'm happy to say that SoCal Gas will also be um, providing a match to my donation. Um, yeah, thank you, SoCal Gas. Um, and if I can give you maybe one more reason to consider giving. So I, I did put the ask out on LinkedIn, and I got a text from my friend saying she's donating. And she went to undergrad at USC. <laughs> so if she's giving money to UCLA and she's a Trojan, by all means, I think uh, that should inspire us all. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know, in conclusion, um, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. It, you know, it was wonderful being here uh, with so many familiar faces from, from the community, uh, from my professional life, of course, my family. Um, it was just a wonderful experience. And um, again, get out of your comfort zone. Be open to new ideas and new interpretations. And you will have these you know, incredible experiences. So with that, go Bruins. Right. Thank you so much, Hillary, for a fabulous uh, presentation, inspiring, I hope, our young people here. Um, if you have a question, and, and have you written an index card, please pass it up. So we're going to have a chance to ask Hillary some questions. Um, and I have uh, one right here that, if you'd like to answer it, um, is could you briefly talk about what you did with submarine landslides? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so this is going to sound silly after all my love of field work. Um, I got to University of Texas, and I really wanted to do an engineering geology project. And what was available was someone had already had the fun of going out on a, a scientific cruise, which is not like a, it's not like a, a cruise cruise. It's very different. But what they had done is they had taken some core samples, so they'd gotten some rocks from a submarine landslide. And what I did is I took those cores and I, I did um, some CT scans of them to you know, see the quality of the cores. And then I actually cut out some of the material from the cores and I put it in these um, devices that like squish the rocks. <laughs> so it was a fully, fully lab uh, focused um, thesis. But the, the practical part is if you're an oil company and you're drilling offshore, um, and you happen to go through a submarine landslide formation, uh, you could have an incident. So understanding very clearly where the different geologic formations are is actually a big safety thing for drilling. So, so that was me. I spent a lot of time in a lab squishing rocks. Um, actually, any other index cards pass through? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, let's see. 
All right, let's see if I can read this. Are there conversations with insurance companies about creating long-term coverage for carbon storage structure competency? So companies are not liable if carbon leaks 200 years from now. That's a great question. No, that is a great question. Um, and I, I know a lot of the financial incentives around carbon management do, do require, like, yes, the, the CO2 will stay there. I am not sure. Um, I would love to ask my, my friend, Dr. Kelly Harride, who works for an insurance company on, on climate change issues, but I, I don't know. It is a good question, though. Here's, here's another good question. Um, how much is the chance that newly graduates of geology get hired in the oil industry these days? Yeah, no, it's, it's another good question. I mean, I will say you almost certainly need a master's um, in general for geology. You almost certainly need a master's. Um, and, you know, I attended a great presentation last year that was sponsored by an oil company. And one of the things that they're really focused on now are climate change projects. And so they had this really cute story of a geologist named Pat who, who came into an oil company solely to work on climate change projects. So I do think, particularly in Kern County and particularly in Houston, the places that have been the home to oil are where these climate change projects are happening. So, and it is the oil companies. I mean, we are all in this together. So I do think there is opportunity to go work for a fossil fuel company on climate change projects and make meaningful impact. Here's another question. Where do you plan to collect the CO2 from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the projects that I'm looking at right now uh, have two focuses. One is just capturing it out of the air. So that's kind of, you know, the cleaning up the bathtub, going after past emissions. And I'm not super familiar with the technology, but essentially, I think there's these fans and they have some sort of um, materials that are able to absorb the CO2. Uh, that, that is pretty inefficient. So we're doing a big look at the life cycle analysis of everything that's needed to build this. You still have a net positive. Uh, far more efficient to capture CO2 from the source. So we're also looking at projects. You know, take cement. Cement as an industry emits a lot of CO2 just, just because of the process. Uh, so they can switch to cleaner fuels, but they still naturally emit some CO2. So we're also looking at projects where we could connect to companies that, uh, that tend to generate a lot of emissions and, and companies that probably will be around for several decades. So they have a solution as well. Yeah, and I think with, this is a good question to close uh, with, um, you know, before we say goodbye and thank Hillary once again, which is, I am curious if carbon sequestration has been fully vetted and do geologists feel it is safe? Yeah, no, that's a really good and fair question too. Um, so a lot of the programs that I'm involved in are through um, federally funded efforts and everything is phased. So the way it works is if you have a site in mind, you know, the first phase is on modeling. And so these oil companies are partnering up with universities to do a lot of modeling efforts. One thing that they're looking at in particular is induced seismicity. And then the next phase of these efforts is to drill a test well and see, again, you know, maybe they find that purple layer that they didn't know about. So, so doing some more due diligence uh, but yeah, no, I, it's a fair question because you do want this to be a net benefit. And, and I do feel that, you know, this is a really promising technology. Um, but, you know, it's a very fair question. All right. And with that, I want us to uh, thank Hillary again. But before that, because I don't want her to forget us, we have some <laughs> gifts for you, uh, you. both uh, from the UCLA, uh, from UCLA in general, and EPSS. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the inaugural post-COVID uh, Distinguished Alumni Lecture.